Mike, 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 that was interesting part one and thrilling part three, yeah, right, but thrilling part two. See, I'm so thrilled that I missed, uh, I already jumped to part three. So let's go to part three now. And uh, here we are on part three of Cadence Life in the Fast Lane. Over to you, sir, Mike, just thrill us more, thrill us more. Here we go. All right. Go get the uh, slides up here. That's part three. There it is. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're going back to Cadence. I'm sorry. Yeah, part three. Yes. Okay. So we're back to life in the fast lane, Cadence. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just to kind of recap where we've been, you know, in the first segment, we talked about, you know, technology setting up the speed that, that uh, the global economy is moving at. And we talked a little bit about the speed of organizations and how they run at a much slower speed than technology does. And uh, then we got into the second phase where we talked about the two different speeds creates a gap and then that gap it creates opportunity and it creates risk and the real secret to surviving in today's economy is being able to manage that risk or manage that gap and so that you understand the risk you understand the opportunity so you can take advantage of those things that are opportunities can manage the things that are risk and that kind of sets you up to maintain your place in the global marketplace. So now we go from that uh, to the next segment. Before you go to the next segment, sir, uh, is yes, when uh, we spoke of cadence and you told me cadence and then you put life in the fast lane. Uh, I know you love eagles, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> So, uh, how do you relate to Eagle's life in the fast lane and what we are talking about, our life getting into the fast, the fast lane? <laughs> well, as long as I don't age as much as Joe Walsh, I'm probably okay. But, uh, no, I mean, that's the thing that, that I don't know if it's a blessing that, you know, we're this far into our lives. You know, because um, I don't really know what the long term effect of this is going to be, but, you know, so we're kind of slowing down naturally, I guess. Uh, but the world around us is speeding up. Uh, but when I look at the younger people, you know, they're coming out of college, they're coming out of high school. I mean, you don't even have to go to college anymore. Uh, to be able to create quite a life for yourself uh you look at it you know if you've got really good grasp on technology and things like that uh, you know you can really move uh but i mean they're they're moving at a very very fast pace at a very very young age and it's getting faster and faster and faster uh you've got to wonder what the long-term effects are uh and maybe it won't be anything. Maybe that's, you know, maybe that's just going to be life as they know it. Uh, I would certainly hope so. They would have uh, a condition by then. There's a natural conditioning effect, probably. They will get conditioned by the fast movement. Yeah, I would hope so. You know, it's like the story yeah. about, you know, the frog in the water and then raising the heat of the water, mm -hmm. uh, the temperature of the water. But, you know, I mean, I think, I mean, the negative effect we see with the speed right now is that it creates stress and the stress, of course, creates health issues. Uh, it creates a lot of different kinds of issues, but particularly the health issues. And I'm hoping that, you know, the speed that the younger kids, as long as things are going to move that fast and they're getting used to that pace, 
uh, there won't be that negative aspect to it. But you've got to wonder where it's all going to go, right? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know why you even picture where it's going to be in 50 years. You know, I mean, it's tough enough to just picture where you're going to be in five. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, we're hoping it conditions them. Uh, but, I mean, you watch them now. I mean, you know, you watch grandkids, you know, I mean, you know, we had a two-year-old that, you know, he would jump up and he knew that, you know, YouTube was on the computer by the time he was two years old. He knew that, that um, you know, YouTube had, you know, Baby Shark on it, you know, and so the minute he'd walk in the house, he'd want the computer on, he'd want to see Baby Shark, you mm -hmm. know, and that's two years old, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I barely had any, any idea what a television was at two years old. So, yeah, I mean, these guys are moving so fast. I mean, and what they do uh, with computers anymore is absolutely amazing. You know, I mean, you know, like I said, we had a real estate photography uh, company we were doing. And I mean, you could shoot pictures of an empty house and they could they could fill it with any style furniture or any color that you wanted. Uh, you know, and I, all they had to do is have that original version to start with and I mean and it doesn't seem they don't look at it as if it's a big deal it's it's just technology that's been around them and they're used to it and so they're already moving way faster than we ever even dreamed of so Mike uh, uh, while I'm sure you will cover it up in the next segment I mean the next slide what is so curious where I'm getting curious is that you told us in the first part how the technology is moving. You showed us how the uh, organization is moving. Now you have two things like what we discussed. You have this leadership who are a generation uh, much probably uh, younger to us, but older to the rapidly growing youngsters and there would be a gap while you have said about technology and the organization there would be a gap between the thinking of the leaders who are there and the youngsters who are there i don't know what has that got to do with the great resignation also i leave it to you you are the author now let's hear the third part <laughs> well you know i think that's part of part of where we're having the difference in the two generations right i mean there was there was always this generation gap and and I think it was probably less of a problem, actual problem, than when we talked about it. But now, you know, it's it's a it's really had a huge effect because it's it's changed organizations, right? We've got these enormous organizations, okay, like Amazon, okay, that's basically changed our our shopping you know, around. And so, I mean, you look at the leadership, you know, that's in Amazon, it's like, okay, how do I run that business? Okay. With, and it's got to be geared towards the younger kids. They don't want to go to the store. Okay. They don't want to hang up. I mean, I remember when I, the big thing was, okay, well, the cultural centers of the United States are shopping malls. Okay. Now you're seeing shopping malls being closed down right and left because nobody wants to go hang out in the shopping mall. So now the leadership says, okay, I don't have retail outlets anymore. I've got to do it online. How do I do it online? How do I manage distribution centers? I mean, you look at, at the, the distribution centers for Amazon, you know, and it's, a, it's an amazing technology thing. So you look at the leadership, but you look at older leadership and does older leadership have the vision to understand you know, or are willing to understand that everything's changed. And I saw a thing the other day that said, uh, you know, you're going the wrong direction if you're using uh, surveys, you know, with your employees to understand, you know, what they're doing, which I think is completely wrong. I mean, the only way to understand, particularly if you've got an age gap that you're dealing with, uh, the only way you're going to understand what your employees want, need, or desire is if you talk to them, you know, 
and some of them want to talk to you and some of them don't want to talk to you. So you've got to have a, a way for them to communicate with you. Uh, you know, and so, I mean, you know, we've got a, a company that we deal with uh, that does a very fast uh, employee survey and uh, is very customizable. And so, I mean, if there's specific things that you want to know about your organization, you know, if it's like, okay, we're getting, we're getting a lot of resignations. What are the things that are, that are important to these people so that we don't lose them, you know, be, instead of doing, I mean, I saw one of the most idiotic strategies I've ever seen is a way to deal with resignation generation was to do exit interviews. If you're doing exit interviews, it's too, too late. They're already leaving, right? <laughs> I want to talk to them before they leave, you know, so that I can fix something. And so if the issue is flexible work hours or if the issue is working out of the house, you know. Yeah, it has got, very often it has got nothing to do with the monetary side of it. It has got to do with uh, very often, and this is my fair guess, I don't have a research behind it. It is more to do with the more of the intangible part of it than the tangible part of it. So how are you going to retain that person? Yeah, the only way you're gonna, the only way you're gonna understand what they want is you've got to communicate with them. Sometimes yes. you can talk to them, you know what I mean? If you look at Myers-Briggs, you know, you know, they class, one of the first things they do is classify you as an introvert or an extrovert, and it's about a 50-50 split, okay? So if I want to log online and talk to you, you know, or call you on the phone and talk to you, that's fine. That's good for about 50% of them. Are you going to ignore the other 50%? Maybe they're the guys that are comfortable that where they want to respond to it to a, a uh, survey where you can't tell who's saying what. Uh, you know, you need to be open to a lot of different ways of communicating with the people you're doing. Uh, you can Otherwise, always fake no... it. You can always fake it. You can always yeah, absolutely. fake it. So, yeah, I mean, you know, and it's the other thing is you've got to appreciate the people you have, uh, you know, because it's always more expensive to go out and try and find somebody new. Uh, first off, there's a risk of getting somebody that's not any good, you know, if you don't know who you're hiring or if you don't. Hey, hey Mike, the other part. Uh, but to tell me uh, if I get it right, I'm, I'm just paraphrasing it. Uh, I think it was Richard Bronson, our uh, gentleman who uh, the Virgin uh, Airlines he runs. He said, uh, train the people uh so that they can leave the organization but treat the people so that they don't want to leave the organization something to that effect yeah it's, you know, and, <laughs> yeah that's a that's a richard branson quote but richard branson, yeah, richard, you know, yeah yeah i'll tell you where you can if you've ever flown on virgin atlantic airlines mm. uh you'll see the difference that that the way he's gotten his people involved and the way the people are trained and the way they treat you when you're on the airplane. I mean, you sit here and you watch the difference. You know, you see this thing going on at night where there's people that are getting in fist fights and all these confrontations on airplanes. You get on a Virgin Atlantic flight and I mean, it's a completely different experience. You know, I mean, you hear a lot about how great Singapore air is and it is okay. But you get on Virgin Atlantic, right? And if you're flying business class and you're flying out of New York, I mean, the lounge there is spectacular. There's a chef there that fixes food for you. You know, so it's, it's actually not a very long flight to London. It's only about six hours. There's a part of the plane where you can go in and sleep. And nobody's allowed to make noise. They don't show movies or anything else. You can just sleep while you're in there. You get to London, uh, if you got a long time between flights, you know, there's another, there's a revivals lounge. Uh, you know, if you're in the club, you know, you can get a haircut, you can get a manicure, you can get a pedicure. They've got a hot tub. I mean, this is a completely different model for the air, airline industry. You know, and when we started flying them in 2004, you know, if I decide I need to get into South Africa, I'd almost always call Virgin Atlantic because I could go to London and I love being on their airplanes. I mean, you even have in-flight massages, you know, but uh, 
you know, it was only a matter of maybe a year or two before you had to make a reservation three months in advance uh, because the planes were full. And, you know, it doesn't take long for people that understand what that market is and what that market responds to and what kind of technology you can use to to deliver that to those people. And, you know, Virgin, I mean, Richard Branson is one of those ones. He's leveraged uh, just a huge amount of leverage in his relationship with the people that work for Virgin. Uh, how to just deliver the, the best experience that you can get. Hey, uh, Mike, Mike, now that uh, we know each other, we have become quite uh, good friends. When you're booking uh, your uh, seat, uh, your uh, the thing uh, for the space uh, tours uh, tour, uh, please book one for me adjacent to yours, okay? So please do that <laughs> <laughs> for the space tour, okay? So let's. <laughs> so uh, coming to what we are saying of cadence, I think we we have really uh, we are really on the beat, right? Both of us, we're going to the space together. And thanks to uh, <laughs> so so look at that. Well, you, we talked in the first part the gulf, the gap uh, increasing within technology and organization. Then we talked about disruption, uh, dystopia, the difference between the, them, and then we talked a little bit about the generation gap, which has now become a generation gulf, and then putting all this together in this model. You and me have to still run the consultant business of continuous improvement. <laughs> oh, please speak to us about that. How are you going to do continuous improvement, support and sustain this improvement movement? Over to you. All right. Uh, I promise you, are you are you booking a seat? Then please book for me too for the space. <laughs> <laughs> so really for and this is kind of going back to to just the business you and i are in okay is is how does all this affect the discipline of continuous improvement right because that's really the audience we're, we're trying to address i mean we'll address you know of course strategic planning and things like that but uh what's it what's the effect on continuous improvement because at the end of the day our business is about change, okay? I mean, you can't have improvement unless you have change, okay? So we're talking about speed of change. We're talking about people's relationship to change. We're talking about a lot of different opportunities here. So let's talk a little bit about how what we do for a living relates to the, the things that we've been talking about up to this point. Okay, so we go back to this thing. Yep. Uh, what is continuous improvement you know and, and there's it's amazing to me that you know if you look out there you go out and say okay i want to get a good definition of quality there's big organizations whose businesses and is quality that refuse to define it because they can't come up to it can't come up with an agreement on what it is okay so if i can't come up with an agreement on what it is how do i even know what i'm improving right so realistically, uh, this quote from Shingo kind of brought it down to where it's it's really something they can operate with. And basically he says, okay, the four purposes of continuous improvement is make it easier, better, faster, and cheaper. But he also says these four goals appear in the order of priority. Uh, and then that you need to keep in context of what was going on in the world when he made the quote. Uh, that may be in a little bit different order, uh, but it doesn't really matter if it is. It doesn't it, matter. It is the order. Yeah, I mean, because realistically, you can't do anything uh, without affecting one of the others, right? Yeah. So, I mean, if I look at those factors, okay, oh, I love if this. I make things. I love this. Yeah, if things easier, better, and faster, they're going to be cheaper. Mm. Okay, so, you know, regardless of, 
of the order and the priority that they're in, uh, you know, I'm going to affect one without the other because there's a relationship. So better and easier is going to give me faster, you know, less free work, easier makes it faster to do. So all the factors have some kind of relationship between them. Um, so if I take a look at all that, okay, and then I take Shingo's ideas on improvement, uh, right now, speed, okay, cadence has become a very, cons a very serious competitive strategic factor, you know, and then you go back to the Jack Welch quote, you know, if you don't have a competitive advantage, then don't compete. Mm. Okay. Well, that competitive advantage right now is speed speed is dead critical to everything mm. okay so we have the uh, long-term risk you know, well, just so hold on uh, i just want sure. to absorb it a little uh, is if i'm just focusing on the word speed i require speed to understand the first part of what we presented okay to recognize that the gap is growing yeah. Right. I require the speed yes. to understand the disruptions that we can create or, or whatever definition that we have gone through. We can we need the speed to understand the <laughs> dystopia. I got it again. Correct. <laughs> dystopia, the speed. See, the, I got the speed of pronouncing the word very well now. The speed <laughs> to, for dystopia to understand whether, how do you get a control of it? And that's the essence as I see it. And then the speed to recognize that there is a generation gap of thought, thought priorities in life between the generations. So the speed becomes a very significant part of all this aspect. The way I gather what you have taught me so far. Yeah, and, and that's where I think, you know, maybe the difference is between, you know, Shingo said they're in order of priority. Mm. And I think in that difference in time between when he made the quote and the environment we operate in now, speed may have moved up in terms of priority. Because I mean, if you're, if you can't maintain the pace, uh, you know, I mean, it's be like, okay, well, I want to, I want to deliver the most perfect car that's ever been built. Okay. But if it takes you six months to make one. Okay. And the market has attack time. I mean, last time I was working in automotive, we were moving the a vehicle move from one station to the next every eight minutes. Okay. And it takes me six months to build a car. I can't compete. Okay. So it doesn't really matter that my quality is, is perfect. Okay. Because the speed disqualified me. And I'm not saying I can get around good quality because I'm faster, but it takes that. It takes both of those. Uh, but the first thing that takes you out of the, out of the, uh, equation is your speed you yeah uh, just one minute i hold you there so the threat now is on obsolescence correct it's on obsolescence yeah. how fast yeah. uh, your products or services can become obsolete yeah obsolete irrelevant yeah. i mean that's i mean that's one of the things you look at when you you know when you look at people and i mean i've had some of these conversations on on uh, linkedin uh very recently right where people want to make issues out of things and they want to bring them up and they want to have this huge discussion on them and you look at it and you can go there's a thing on google called google trends which will show you how often a subject gets searched for okay mm -hmm. and so people show up and they're like well okay i want to talk about this this topic Okay, and you go back and you post this graph and it says Google Trends goes back 16 years and there isn't even a single data point plotted 
for that particular subject in the last 16 years. So what you want to have a discussion on, I mean, if you want to have it for esoteric reasons, that's fine, but it's really irrelevant, okay? So with speed, a lot of things that everybody's kind of hung up on and things like that, you can be obsolete and you can just be irrelevant. I mean, you can just plain not matter anymore because they want to talk about something that just doesn't have anything to do with what's going on today. You know, I mean, if somebody wants to have a discussion about, okay, I mean, remember, remember the world was trying to shift to uh, from VHF to tapes to beta. Yeah. And all of a sudden they came out with uh, CDs, you know, DVDs. Nobody ever wanted to talk about Betamax tapes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> because that technology just kind of skipped a generation, right? It does. And I lost at least 1,000 CDs because my laptop did not have a, a place to put a CD on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sitting here. I've got a case full of CDs with old material on it. Wow. You know, I've got to get an extra drive because the computer I'm using right now doesn't have it. As a CD. Either. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, now everything plugs in, right? So you've got all these wires running all over, right? Yeah, one but uh, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, whatever I have on CD is already available on YouTube. So I don't even require CDs <laughs> now. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I've got somewhere around here, I've got my original, you know, thumb drive. Okay. And this thing is probably four inches long, okay? And it's 250K, okay? And it was the first thumb drive I had in 2003. <laughs> you look at it, and now I've got these little tiny things, you know, that are about the size of an integrated circuit. Yeah. Actually, they're smaller than integrated circuits. You know, and I mean, that's just that technology thing, okay? So much of it is changing so fast. We don't keep track of it. Uh, and like I say, the younger people, they're just rolling them right through it because it's just the way it's always been. Uh, so, yeah. So, okay, so we have a, a long-term risk if we don't keep track of technology. Yeah, we are talking uh, about the speed and uh, how uh, Shingo is uh, true, relevant, even today, it may not be the same sequence as what is said, but speed matters right now. That's what we were talking about. Yeah, I think it's still the same factors. I think the priority is just different. You know, I say, you know, I can be really fast, but if I don't have, you know, some minimum level of quality, I'm not going to be a player in the market. You know, and if I don't have some sort of ease in the market, particularly in terms of manufacturing, then I can't be at the right price point, right? Mm. So, you know, you've got to have a, you've got to have a balance, but if I got to pick priority, uh, the rest can, I can make everything else irrelevant if I'm just not fast enough to compete. You okay? That's, sounds good. <laughs> okay. Sounds good, sounds good. Okay, so. Okay, so we have a long term uh, risk factor with technology. Uh, we people, I think, very seriously understand uh, the value of change management. Okay, they certainly understand the value of sustainable change uh, or sustainable improvement, sustainable change, uh, because, you know, there's companies that have fixed the same problem over and over and over and over again. Uh, so they keep spending the same money. They're buying the same real estate uh, two or three times. Uh, and then hopefully after kind of going through these scenarios, people are starting to understand that the, uh, the uh, strategic value of managing that gap uh, so that they've got some kind of, you know, it used to be important when people would talk about having the vision. If you don't understand that gap, your vision can be way off, you know, so you can have a corporate vision that isn't accounting for anything that's occurring in the gap. And you're going to end up putting yourself out of the market again. 
So yeah, you've got to have you've got to have that gap to to really understand your how to create the vision for your organization. This one uh, is interesting, okay, and this is this is going to be uh, I don't know, kind of it it could be could inflame a lot of of the continuous improvement things. Uh, so this is from Jobs. He says he has a great deal of respect for incremental improvement, meaning, you know, when you hear a lot about the different tools, you know, they talk about they're focused on incremental improvement. Uh, but he says the things that really intrigued him the most were the more revolutionary changes. He says he doesn't know why. Uh, it's really not that hard to figure out when you look at the products that he created. Uh, but he does admit they're much more stressful emotionally. So he's still tied to that same idea that we got from Toffler in 1970. You got this guy Jobs that came out, you know, hit the world with computers, hit the world with iPods, hit the world with iPhones. I mean, you got more technology in your iPhone now than they had on some of the the Apollo space capsules. Okay, so you look at all that that's going on. And that's again, going back to that, the idea of speed. If I'm doing incremental improvement, am I really keeping up with the pace of technology? Okay, if maintaining that speed, and what I'm what I believe is, is the right approach to product quality is incremental improvement. And I've got technology moving at an exponential rate. How am I keeping up? And if I get hit with, with a disruption, okay, where all of a sudden something occurs, now I've got to react to what occurred Okay, so I'm Microsoft, all of a sudden Linux is out there floating around on the internet, and it's free. I don't have time to go take little baby steps. Okay, I've got to be able to leapfrog, I've got to be able to go from here to there, and I've got to be able to do it in a very short period of time. I don't have time to kind of shuffle along and say, well, you know, we're going to do a little incremental change here and a little incremental change there. Okay, certain industries, maybe that's good. Okay, but if you're out there on the cutting edge technology, you're moving too slow to be part of the organization. The organization is going to decide who creates value and who doesn't create value. And if you can't move as fast as the organization moves, I mean, this is basic theory of constraints. Where's Herbie? Okay. If Herbie is your continuous improvement person, you got a problem with Herbie, right? So, you know, it's where, it, where's Herbie located? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're going to, if you're going to try and keep pace with technology, but you can't keep pace with technology because the continuous improvement people <clears throat> are going too slow, you've got to look for a different solution. So even in his time, Jobs noticed, you know, made the improvement. He recognized, yes, there is incremental improvement, okay, and he has a great respect for it, but it's not what intrigues him, okay. And this is the guy that drove technology crazy. So you need to pay attention to a little bit of him. Okay, so we go back to the wisdom, going back in uh, to 1964. Uh, this is a book that was written by Joseph Duran, uh, definitely one of, of the uh, yeah. founding fathers of quality. I mean, you know, he did a lot of work in Japan and did a lot of work in the U.S. You know, certainly in my time period, you know, the quality control handbook was, I don't know, I probably have four or five different versions of it over the years because you keep buying the newest uh newest release but uh 
he wrote this book that I don't know that a lot of people have paid enough attention to in 1964. Uh, it's called Managerial Breakthrough. Yes. Uh, and it introduced an idea that, that I think you saw the Japanese or at least Toyota production system react to, but I'm not sure the United States has ever really reacted to it. So in this book, he talks about there's a difference between control and control being a lack of change. Okay, if something's in control, it's not changing. Okay, you're maintaining status quo. And then he talks about breakthrough as being dynamic change. Okay, so when we look at what we've been talking about up to this point, control's not what we're looking for. Okay, if you're part of this society that's moving at an exponential rate of speed, having a strategy of lack of change doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Okay, breakthrough is what you're, is what you're looking for, dynamic change. And so we look at that and it says, okay, I've got my choice. I can do control or I can do breakthrough. I've got a cadence that's an ex running at exponential uh, rate of speed. What am I going to do? Okay. So incremental is going to be too slow to deliver required quality. Okay. And it'll have me out of the market. Breakthrough is going to allow me to make maintain speed. So this is the model, and this drawing is in the book. Uh, this is a this is a version that I did, but I mean it's it's uh, out of it's a, basically the idea that was in his book. And if you look at it, okay, you look at the you look at the top part, okay, and it says okay here's control, then you go through breakthrough, and then you come down to another part. So there's a control chart on the top and then you go through the breakthrough process and then you come down through into another control chart okay but look at the distance between the, the upper and lower control limit okay when i'm in the control in the first point okay the lines are are considerably further apart than they are on the bottom okay as part of that breakthrough strategy i'm learning the difference between things that control the mean and things that control the variation. Okay, because when I go through breakthrough, more often than not, I'm trying to shift the mean. And the mean, and this isn't, a, of course, going to be a rule, but if I want to shift a mean, the first place I look is at knob variables. I can turn a knob and all of a sudden that mean will shift. And, and that's part of why uh, control charts are so valuable, right? They help you understand how to make adjustments or they can, if you use them, you can use them to help you make adjustments so that you don't over control. Uh, but you can also use them if I say I want to move move into a different spot. Uh, you know, I can look for knob variables and then I can look for other variables that control the variation. Okay. Lot to lot variation from suppliers. Uh, set up to set up variation, you know, when I'm doing, uh, you know, you know, setting a machine up for production, uh, toolware controls variation so that I sort those variables out. So now I move from this top part of the chart where I've got wide control limits. Okay, I go through the breakthrough process. I'm learning about what variables control what. I'm shifting to a place that somehow I've determined is a better target. And because I now understand what variables control what, when I get to that new point, I can be in a better state of control because I know which variables are controlling which part of that variation, right? As when I'm in the control sorry, chart. Sorry, sorry, there's just a thought occurred to me. And this control, which we thought uh, was not possible, is made possible by the technology now. Am I right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you look at it now, right? And I mean, you know, and again, not, not trying to promote somebody's product because I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on controllers. But 
you know, one of the things that used to be a big deal was, you know, could buying, you know, controllers was expensive. Buying sensors was, was expensive. I mean, I can buy a Raspberry Pi controller on online right now for less than a hundred dollars, you know, and I mean, sensors are popcorn parts, you know, I mean, I can sense heat, I can sense vibration, I can do all kinds of things. You know, you look at, at the technology behind total productive maintenance and, and I can go to proactive maintenance just with very simple controllers and sensors that I didn't have before. So, you know, when I look at this, you know, do I really need, I mean, how hard is it for me to make adjustments? I mean, I can run as tight as I want. I mean, if you look at the, the you know, like a temperature controller, you know, I see the heaters come on, they drive the temperature up. Okay, it drifts down, it goes up in a very sharp, sharp, sharp angle. Sorry about that. And then it drifts down, it hits to a certain threshold and it drives it back up. So I can stay within a very tight band uh, just with the technology side of it, because now I've got sensors, I've got controllers, you know, and I don't have to wait for somebody to come around, take a temperature reading, make an adjustment. And even, Controller uh, does all that. I'm, I'm sorry for this. Again, the thoughts, uh, uh, because it's so interesting that the thoughts just spark off. Uh, that's the, don't blame it on me, it's the speed of thoughts. Okay. <laughs> what I'm saying <laughs> not only control the even the detection has become uh, uh, far easier with technology and uh, so uh, so you you will be able to detect uh, things faster isn't it oh yeah absolutely i mean if you look at okay if, yeah, if you look at what we have what we call the in the in texas we have a lot of it what we call stranded assets, okay? I have these pump jacks that sit out all over the place in Texas. And it's an oil well that's been drilled and there's this thing out there, it's a pump jack and it pumps oil, okay? There's nobody out there, okay? And usually there's somebody that was paid every day to go around and check all of them, maybe lubricate them or whatever. Nowadays, I can buy a system where I put sensors all over that pump jack. I'm looking at heat, I'm looking at temperature, I'm looking at vibration, I'm looking at all kinds of things. It all goes to a controller. That controller goes on the internet, goes back to a control room, and some guy where I used to have a bunch of people going around and visiting all these stranded assets, now you've got one person sitting in a room He's looking at all these readings. Okay, he's got screens in front of him. Half the time he doesn't even need screens. He's just got alarm buttons. Okay, and then from the alarm button goes off, he can access the data. He can look at the data and decide what's going on. And it says, okay, the temperature is going up on this particular pump jack. We need to send somebody out there. So here's this person gets in a truck, goes out there, looks at the pump jack and says, this is what it is. Okay. So now he's proactively doing it. You don't have to wait for that thing to stop operating. Okay. And hope the guy catches it the next morning. He's out there working on it before it even goes down. Now, if you look at the other side of it, where you've got, you know, and, and maybe petroleum industry isn't a great thing to use for an example right now, but you know, when I look at it, if I pull a rig out to drill an oil well, I can spend easily 25, 35,000, if I'm just on land, 25, $30,000 a day to have that drill rig out there. Okay, if it breaks down, I'm wasting money because it's not drilling while it's out there. Okay, now you get control systems that have sensors all over these drill rigs, okay? And you're now, you're not at total productive maintenance. You're beyond total productive maintenance. You know, you're at total proactive maintenance. It's still P TPM, but it's proactive because you've got this $25 or $35 a day asset sitting there and you can monitor the things that are going wrong and react to them before you actually lose drilling time. So you look at the technology 
and what it's done. And you look at this chart and it's like, I can operate down here in this really low profile area because the technology lets me do that down there, right? I mean, I can sense tool where I can, you know, I mean, it's not hard for me to read toolware on a tool as I'm making something. Uh, the other thing that this lets us do, right? And you bring this in from another process because, you know, we don't want to be in little isolated camps, okay? Uh, so I go over here and here's this, this idea that Taguchi introduced uh, called the Taguchi loss function. Yes. Okay, and it says, I want to operate on this. There's a, there's a specific target. And when I'm on that target, I'm, I'm not imparting loss to society. Okay. So how do I move to that target? You see a lot of people that say, well, you know, you want to operate right in the middle of the upper and lower spec limit. That's nonsense. That is not necessarily the most economical place to operate. Okay, when I made sensors, I used to plate gold. Okay, where's the cheapest place to operate if I'm plating gold? The cheapest place for me to operate is on the lower spec limit. I'm still making good parts because I'm still making parts that's within specification. Okay, but I'm also putting on the minimum amount of gold that I need to put on that part. Okay, that allows me as an organization to make more money because if I if I plate on more gold, the part's not necessarily any better, okay? It's still within spec, but I put more cost into it because I put more gold on it, okay? Well, this, this, so, sorry, this reminds me, uh, I was uh, with my uh, uh, medical doctor and uh, he came up by saying that, you know, uh, for your blood pressure, uh, we are now looking at your blood pressure being at this lower end, and we are not looking at the upper and lower systolic, end, which itself has now reduced. He said, we are looking so that even if you have a spike due to some other reason, okay, you are at the lower limit, okay? Uh, I don't know how, uh, you understand where I'm coming from, that you are at the lower limit, so that even if there's a spike, it's not gonna harm you. But we are not going to say that, okay, you're within the limits, so you can fluctuate within the limits. That's a health specialist telling me that, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I mean, they've learned they've learned the value of it. I mean, you know, you've got sensors that, I mean, you look at the things that you can wear on your wrist right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, it's monitoring your heart. It's monitoring all kinds of things. Uh, you know, and I mean, it uploads to a computer. You know, I mean, you can do all kinds of things with your health. And, and once you have that kind of data, it's no different than running any other process, right? You can react, you can be active and, and things like that. Uh, you know, what I like in this uh, also is your emphasis, which you have put in bold of Kayakoku. If I pronounce it right, <laughs> Kayakoku. 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 Uh, I'm sure some Japanese will run, uh, or I should commit a hierarchy for that. Uh, <laughs> how do you pronounce that word? But, you know, yeah, and that's the part that I, I think where, you know, we, we kind of got, this is where TPS, Toyota Production System, lines up really well with what Duran wrote, uh, where he talked about control and he talked about breakthrough, you know, and, and of course we latched on to Kaizen. You know, everybody's talking about Kaizen now, and, and it's actually gotten a whole new meaning to it. You know, and again, it fits real well, incremental change and all this. Okay, but we never, for some reason, we never latched on to the idea. They also have the idea, TPS has the idea of Kaikaku, which is a breakthrough strategy. So, you know, everybody's kind of going, well, you know, for all these years, we've talked about incremental improvement and the Kaizen parts lines up real, real well with the incremental improvement we've always talked about. So we'll talk about Kaizen. 
you know, and somebody's going, well, what about this Kaikiku thing? And then it's like, no, now we're going to stay focused on Kaizen. Okay. So now what they need is, okay, you've got, whether you like it or not, this technology engine is telling you, you better be moving faster. And you can stay with the little incremental improvement if you want. And I'm not saying it's not any good. Okay, of course, I mean, you're never going to give up looking for the bits and pieces. But, you know, as the life cycle gets shorter and shorter, you've got less time to do it. Okay, and if you get hit with some kind of disruption, you've got to be able to recover. And you don't get years and years and years to recover. You need to be able to have some kind of breakthrough strategy that says, okay, you hit me with disruption. I need to at least catch up with you, if not go ahead of you. And so I need a breakthrough strategy. And that's what Kaikaku is in TPS. Okay, so we watch people, you know, focus on Kaizen, but you need to case stay focused on the thing that's going to be most relevant to what you're trying to do. You need the Kaikaku as well as the Kaizen. Okay, so yeah, you need the Kaizen. Uh, uh, I mean, just to interrupt you that Sensei Masaki my, who was, is my sensei and uh, who is known for Gemba Kaizen, but he was very clear on this. Okay, I'm not getting into it. He had divided the entire thing into certain uh, sections, right? So he did, uh, in a way, uh, speak of Kai Kuku, but uh, there was a different take on that. So uh, I'm with you. They are, uh, yeah, I understand where you're coming from. But uh, since I did have a clue as to what level would do what in a organization setup. Actually, if you look, took a look at the Kaizen Institute uh, triangle, you can see the different levels in that. Well, you know, I, and you know, you can you can pull a lot of pieces in on this. But you know, you go back to, you know, Deming started talking about, you know, his system of profound knowledge, right? And he starts talking about, about system thinking, you know, when you start looking at bits and pieces and say, well, I want to do this and I want to do this and I may, maybe I'll do that, you know, yeah, you're going to get improvement, okay? I mean, it's it's hard to not do some of a little bit of anything and not get some kind of improvement, but the pieces fit together, okay? TPS is Toyota production system. The pieces play together. There's a reason they're in the order they're in there. There's a reason why they do the things they do. And that's, and if you want to understand that, you've got to understand it as a system. Maybe you want to break it apart and, and do things different later on, but your basic understanding needs to come of how does it work together as a system. And if you don't understand that, then you don't, then you don't appreciate why it's built the way it's built. Okay, and I mean, that's kind of where he was pushing that. So, yeah, you know, you, you've got to look at, at things and you can say, yeah, I can do this and I'm, I'm focused on this and I want to do, you know, these little basic improvements, you know, but if that's not what the business needs, then again, you said, okay, I'm, I'm becoming the Herbie. I'm making myself irrelevant inside my own business. And it doesn't make any sense. So, I mean, you can look at this. I mean, look at what we're talking about here. We've got the drawings that, that Rand did in 64. Out of that, you've probably got TPS probably evolved somewhat uh, from the stuff that Duran did because he was over involved over there as well as Deming. And then you've got Taguchi showing up with the loss function. All this ties together. Yes. Okay. In your own head, you can create the system, right? And then again, you've got this whole thing underneath it all that says, you know, we call it lean and, and you know, and more inclined to stay with the TPS version. But, uh, it's, it's focused on flow, okay? So Mike, so, on the, some other uh, episodes, I think uh, we should talk about this 
that we should not be wearing by saying, I am a Deming guy, I am a Juran guy, I am a Ishakawa guy, I am a this guy. I mean, there, you can't be wearing blinkers amongst these uh, legends who brought in the quality movements, right? They're all interconnected somewhere or the other. Uh, that we will keep it for some other day for a greater discussion, in-depth discussion. Let's go down this speed lane, sir, with big break <laughs> speed. I want it. I want. I'm looking forward to that discussion because, yeah, it's it's one of my very pet peeves. Okay, so realistically, where are we? At? Where's the future of continuous improvement? Uh, okay, now we're going to get into something that's very could be very controversial. Okay, when I look at what we're doing right now, okay. Uh, and I came out of Motorola, so, you know, we had DMAIC, uh, we had TPM, you know, we've been through all that stuff. Uh, we started with lean before it was even called lean at the first time it was called cycle time reduction and then it became lean. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm taking something that's already exists and I'm improving it. Okay. And so basically, if you look at what does that actually mean, it says, I did it wrong. And so I'm perfecting all these tools and techniques so I can fix what I did wrong. So when I'm looking at all these tools and techniques, I'm perfecting rework. Okay. I didn't launch a good process to begin with. I didn't launch a good product to begin with. I launched a defective product. I launched a defective process, but I've got great tools and techniques to go back and fix it. Okay, now when you bring this idea up, people get extremely emotional about this uh, because they don't they don't picture continuous improvement as rework. The easiest way to do this is launch it right to begin with. Okay. Don't build design errors into it. Exactly, I mean, exactly. You, true. Yeah, I mean, if you put, if you're building a circuit board and you put round components on it and then you run it through a reflow soldering operation and the little round components rolled and they're not in the right spot anymore, guess what? Round things roll. Okay. This shouldn't be a surprise. Okay, so you either find a different package to put it in or you find a way to glue it down so it doesn't move. Uh, but so I launch when I start to do this thing. The future of this is not in being better at PDCA. It's not better at being at TQM. It's not better at being better at doing lean. It's being better at doing it in the right time, doing it before I launch a product so that when I launch it, I don't need to be doing continuous improvement on the factory floor. When I'm doing continuous improvement on the factory floor, I'm reworking and rework, you're paying for something to be done twice, right? So realistically, where do I wanna be? I wanna focus on product launch, and I want to measure my quality as I'm as I'm designing and building a product, and I want to measure the quality of that launch. So I mean, I'm not going to go overnight from having no continuous improvement, or from having continuous improvement activities to having no continuous improvement activities. But I want to have a metric in place that says, okay, I launched this at. I don't know, 100,000 PPM, okay? And the next product I launched, I launched at 80,000 PPM. All right, whatever I did, I was going the right direction. You know, and if you look, look at a lot of the value engineering things that were done by uh, Boothroyd and Dewhurst, it kind of feeds into that mentality that says, okay, as I'm designing this project, I'm doing value engineering. How can I value, how can I engineer some of these problems out of it? You know, and it's a very good thought process to put yourself in. 
because it says I don't want to perpetuate, you know, this. Okay, and this is where somebody's going to have a fit. I don't want to perpetuate this continuous improvement treadmill that I've got myself on. Okay, I want that treadmill to be over here, you know, and, and maybe it's now an elliptical and it's over before lunch instead of after lunch because it's going to be cheaper over there. I mean, one of the first things you look at when you do improvement, if you're, you know, if you're in a factory, particularly if you're in like a stamping process or something, is okay, I've got this great improvement. What's it going to cost for a tooling change? You know, and I mean, there's always that, okay, hard tooling changes. If I'm stamping body parts, okay, you look at the size of those dies, look at, you know, the effect. If you got to change one of those, you got an expensive problem on your hands. So you look at a lot of this stuff, and I mean, the opportunity, the serious opportunity, is doing it before you launch. Now, the other thing that this goes, that takes us back into the cadence, is if I launch a product and it's got a, it's got defects in it, okay? Now I, I'm taking more time. I'm taking more time to get into the marketplace. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, you look at the guys writing software, people have, people have learned that, you know, you get point releases, okay? And that's just a fact of life with software. They're willing to accept that, but for how long? I mean, there'll be a time when they won't accept that anymore, right? It says, I don't want a point release, okay? I don't want to have Word 2.0. I want to have Word 1.0. That's it, you know, no more. You don't get to do the release thing on me. I want it right from the beginning. So. You're going to get out of that. You're going to eventually get out of that phase where people are willing to accept that you launched it just because you want to get in the market ahead of everybody else. It's going to become a competition to who gets in the market with the best quality. And then it'll get to be the guy that gets in the market with perfect quality. That's that increasing speed. So if I go in and I've got a defective product, it's just more time. Somebody's going to beat you out in terms of speed by going in with better quality. And then somebody's going to go in and beat you out because they go in with perfect quality. So they're proactive. So that's where the contest is going. How do I get there ahead of everybody else? Because what I'm doing right now is really rework. So what I hear no. you saying, what I hear you saying is, uh, uh, is that there is nothing called quality. It is all about competitive quality. Absolutely. You know, I mean, you can, you can get away with poor quality right now on some things as long as you're developing, you know, a really good technology strategy with it or technology innovation with it. But, you know, then that's where the continuous improvement thing gets in. But as you get better and better at launching products, you're making it harder for people to compete with you. If I'm launching perfect products, I mean, why does Toyota have the advantage they have in in uh, the automotive industry? They're famous for being able to produce reasonably priced car with better quality than anybody else. Okay, so you look at that, they can gear up, they can produce, and they don't have problems with, uh, at least not as many problems with recalls as a lot of the other cars do. So they're competing not only on speed, but they're competing on quality at the same time. So you look at it and they've really said, okay, we're gonna take those four things from Shingo and we're gonna make them the real competitive advantage we have, which goes back to the thing from Welch. It says, if you don't have a competitive advantage, don't compete. So basically, if you don't have, if you can't compete on speed and quality with Toyota, stay out of the car business. You know, unless of course you're Elon Musk and you wanna bring in electric cars. You know, and it's and now you're watching Toyota struggle to catch up with Musk on electronic cars. So yeah, you know, this whole thing, there's that speed, there's that quality, that's relationship, you know, speed, quality, cost. I mean, it's all, you know, and again, you know, if I if I wait until I'm in production to fix my cost, that means I went into the market at too high a price. Somebody that comes in, you know, without all the rework 
They don't have to take care of that cost of fixing things once they're already in production. So they're already in at a lower price point than you are. So the, the push has to be coming back to quality on the front end. And there was a push, there was actually a push for this in the, in the 90s. Uh, you know, there was some initiatives out of some of the Detroit uh, manufacturers on cars where they wouldn't let you do a change to a product after a product launch because the supplier quality engineers were made their metric for success was they wouldn't approve they couldn't approve these changes right so they might give you a waiver okay for something because the push was to make all the changes before launch well once you gave them the, the way to go around it to skirt that system with a waiver and then nothing really changed and so eventually the whole idea of, of the upfront quality kind of really lost its impetus. But it's not just indigenous to automotive. This has to be to everything that we see. True. Okay. So what do we have? We have the thing, you know, for people that, that really want to just jump in right now. Okay. I mean, you can, you can spend time creating a system, but again, you're spending time. So you're slowing down. Okay. So realistically, what do we do right now? If I say, okay, I got it. I understand it. I need to get faster. I need to get faster by tomorrow. What can I do right now? There are systems that exist. Uh, I mean, they're not maybe the best systems in the world, but they're at least adequate. Uh, and it's, if you haven't done anything, I mean, doing, doing something is better than doing nothing. So you're gonna see some improvement. And it's like you continuously improve your continuously improvement process, uh, which is something we don't really seem to be very good at doing. Okay, we have all the tools and methodologies and they don't really iterate very fast. Okay, so what exists right now today is what they call advanced product quality planning, APQP. Okay, it's it's pretty well understood. It's pretty well laid out, and you can you can pull those things up and say, okay, let me look at at APQP and let me see how I can adapt that to my business. What can I do with what already exists to kind of launch a program that says. I'm going to start moving towards proactive, continuous improvement. And you can go through the steps that are in here. And again, you look at it and there's that first step called planning. If there's anything that we don't do well, it's planning. I mean, I've been, I've been spent a huge amount of time working on, on programs that are considered failures. You know, and, and I mean, I had one where the president of a sector decided to do a project. And when he got done, he said, so how come my projects don't get the same results as, you know, these previous projects? And, you know, so he started looking at it. And what's going on with a lot of these people is they're not doing planning. There's no plan. Okay. You see it. You see a lot of continuous improvement things and somebody will come in and benchmark you. They don't see the things that made it successful, right? Again, going back to Deming, you know, system level thinking. Uh, if you don't have a plan, you can end up anywhere. You don't even know where you're going, right? And so you need to set up a plan. You need to set up metrics and things like that. So, I mean, you set up this in the beginning. You know, and then you watch the steps that you see in this APQP, and I mean, it takes you down to a logical step and gets you down to production level things. So, I mean, you can institute that today. You don't have to go out, you know, and, and create something that's never been created before. You say, okay, I'm going to start with this. Okay, some people are going to work on this, you know, getting this started. Let's get some leverage going. 
in the meantime, I'll have a, another group that's kind of dovetailed into that group that says, okay, how are we going to, how are we going to iterate APQP uh, so that it fits our business better? So what can we do differently? Okay. Right. So yeah. again, that's, actually, that's... when you uh, when you say that, and uh, I'm sure uh, we are going to uh, have another episode where we are going to discuss all of this uh, of uh, PDSA, as Deming would say for for Walter Schwartz, just <laughs> uh, a plan, do, study, and act. Uh, we can discuss all that uh, in a separate episode. And we can also discuss about uh, what does continuous means and what does continual mean and how the word continuous has been <laughs> distorted. <laughs> Although I'm using it as sustain and support and sustain continuous improvement, but we can discuss what really continuous means and what continual mean. Uh, we can discuss it in some other episode. I have to meet you Absolutely. again before we take the space journey. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a when you start to look at it, there's a lot of of just pure language yeah. issues that set up absolutely that set up the wrong kind of thinking. Okay, uh, so yeah, I mean, if, if we can correct some of that, we can certainly get a lot of things back on track. Actually, it's time that we uh, got back to basics. I'm sorry. It's time that we got back to basics and understand the basics uh, before we uh, moved. We have moved into certain flowery area. I'm not getting into that. Uh, let's flow with your thoughts. I understand <laughs> where you're coming from. So uh, yeah, we, we need to uh, understand what each of them really needs to be understood at this point of time. Yeah, and, and I mean, there's, you know, you've got, you've got groups of people too. You've got you got people that want to philosophize about it. Yeah. You know, you got people that that just want to do it, but they don't want to take the time for the philosophy. I mean, and you've got to have that mixture of both. You've got to have yes. appreciation. And you know, what I is, mean, so I'm sorry, what is appropriate for this point of time, as you rightly said in the first part, second part, and third part, what is the best way we can deal with it and keep uh, the, uh, the momentum on? is what uh, I hear you saying, if I can interpret you right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's there's nothing worse than somebody thinking that, you know, and, and that they've got a one size fits all, you know, because the minute you show up with something, you know, and it doesn't matter what you say, but, you know, I've heard it when we, when we showed up with DMAIC, I've heard it when we show up with Lean, you know, we heard it when we showed up with TQM, you know, they, they go, well, there's no such thing as a silver bullet. And you're going, all right, so what value did that kind of comment add? You know, nobody's selling a silver bullet. You know, nobody's trying to say there's, you know, there's instant pudding, you know, from the dimming quote, you know, there's no such thing as instant pudding, you know, and so sitting on the sideline, you know, having people throw those kinds of comments out it's it's people searching for some way to be relevant in whatever conversation is going on we all understand that i can't take like an ap qp plan like this and go drop it into every single business in the united states and have it work perfectly i mean you got to be smart enough to look at it and say well yeah, it'd work a little bit better if I did this or a little bit better if I did that, you know? And so you iterate things. But then the minute you do that, somebody sits on the side and they go, well, you aren't doing it right. And you're going, I'm doing it right enough for my business, you know? And so you may not like what I'm doing, but unless you're my customer or you're the, you know, somebody that has some control in this business, it doesn't really matter if you don't think it's right. When we hit, you know, and, and I can use this for an example, when we hit the subprime mortgage thing in 2008, I had just bought that business. We were doing 5S and I had a particular relationship with a supplier. And so 
I could cut my inventory very easily because I could get very quick deliveries. And so, you know, you're when you're in a situation like we were there, you're trying to protect cash flow. Okay. Because regardless of what anything else happens in business, cash is king. You don't have any cash, you can be out of business in a heartbeat. So I'm trying to protect cash flow. One of the easiest ways to protect cash flow is you don't type your cash in inventory. So this supplier gave me an advantage to being able to do that. So I cut my inventory. So then I have some people come into my factory and they look at it and they go, where's your inventory? I go, it's right there. And they go, well, that's not very much inventory. I said, I don't need very much inventory. And I said, you know, I'm kind of on, you know, a Kanban kind of thing with inventory. They said, well, it doesn't look like your 5S is done. And it's like, no, my 5S isn't complete. But if I just don't manage my inventory and I focus on doing 5S, I will have the cleanest bankrupt factory in Texas. Okay, everything will be nice and spotless and clean and organized, but I won't have any cash, so I'll close the doors anyhow. So, you know, you've got to kind of look at things and say, right now, the financial market is saying, I need to do this. And because I've got this relationship with this supplier, I can do it. So, yeah, I'm out of order, but I'm doing the right thing for the business. And then you get the guys that walk in and they look at it and go, you're not doing them in the right order. You know, and you're looking at them going, that's because I'm paying for it. It's coming, the cash is coming out of my pocket. So I'm making the decision to do it like that. And we'll eventually get to where we were. Eventually, you know, where we need to be. And so you look at that and yeah, eventually the factory gets clean. It gets organized and everything else, but I'm still alive. I've got 11 less competitors. Okay. I like and that. I've got I, I like that. I like that. Uh, I like that because they said that, you know, you stop your bleeding first and then you go for your uh, CTC, MRI, etc. Otherwise, you will be taking CTC or MRI of a dead body. So stop your bleeding. First. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. You know, so, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's like when I got, a, if I have all of a sudden I got defects in a, you know, in a customer's facility. You know, I can go out and go, well, we're going to have a meeting and we're going to discuss root cause. Or I can go, all right, I want some containment action in place. I don't want any more bad parts getting out of here. So, yeah, you do the containment first. Yeah. You, you contain it to your factory, but then you need to make it go away because otherwise you're just incurring extra cost. And so, yeah, it's, you know, you've got it. You know, that's why, you know, you need to be. You know, everybody says, well, we, you know, we don't need managers, we need leaders. You need both, okay? You get into a situation like that. Uh, I mean, I had a situation, I mean, one of the worst things you can ever do in your life is shut down an, an automotive uh, body and assembly plant, B and A plant. Uh, and I had a situation where we had shut down a B and A plant and you better get that contained because they're writing, you're being fined by the amount of time that you're shutting them down and you can't afford to do that very long. So yeah, containment, you know, being smart enough to do containment is a huge thing in today's industry, right? So yeah, it's being while, flexible. Well, I'll go back to what you were saying. Well, you can contain, but don't move your eyes away from the gap. <laughs> no, you can never take your eyes off that gap ever, you know, and, and again, you know, when uh, you're doing containment, you're also opening the door for another competitor, right? So, yes. all right. So one of the things we can do on the front end, um, you know, and, and I intentionally did not put the house of quality up here, yep. uh, at least not in detail was because when you look at it, the drawing just makes it look so complex and so out of control. Uh, and this kind of breaks it down into phases. Uh, you know, but again, when we looked at that, it said on the front end of that APQP, there was, there was planning, okay? So planning is more than just doing a Gantt chart, 
Okay, so you look at this and I mean, the uh, quality function QFD, quality function deployment can be perceived as part of a planning exercise that you go through. And you can see where it's, it's yeah. going from customer requirements, engineering characteristics, you know, and it moves on and it goes through the complete process uh, until you're finally ready to launch a product. Okay, and this is like containing the issues around design related, particularly design related defects, because the problem with a design related defect is if it's built into your design, it's now going to be present in every single product. Yes. Design doesn't come and go. It is your design. Okay. So, I mean, we did and we'll get into it in a minute. We did some simulation uh, for some people, but their initial design came off the boards at 8 million PPM. And they looked at me and they went, how can I have 8 million PPM? He said, you've got 8 million defects per 1 million parts. He said, it's, it's a ratio. It's like every product's got eight defects. And they're like, no. Oh, Okay, but that's designed. That was designed in their design. If they would have taken it off the boards and gone straight to production, that's the kind of catastrophe they would have had. Uh, you know, I mean, I didn't really do anything special. I mean, it's analysis anybody could have done. But again, we'll talk about that here in a minute. But this is the part on the front end that says the planning. I'm planning for success. I'm planning for no defects. I'm planning on understanding my customer. I'm planning for understanding my uh, production requirements, my process, production processes. I'm not just, you know, doing drawings and getting builds of material out and doing all the things that I normally do. And you look at one of the people that's very good at this, right? Uh, I listened to a guy named Timothy, Timothy Tyson. Uh, and at that time, he was a CEO of a pharmaceutical company and he took as responsibility for him as CEO, you know, the R&D cycle, because he understood that the shorter the R&D cycle on pharmacy or pharmaceuticals gave him more time under the protected market he had. So he could go through the, the R&D phase of some drug, get it to market faster, and still be operating within the constraints of, yeah. of uh, his patent. And so he had a protected market. So he made more money. Okay. So that's what we're doing here. You're going in with a more solid, you know, plan so that you can have more time in a protected market, more profitable. Okay. So you've got that phase of it. Uh, the thing that people need to understand understand too is they pride some a lot of people have seen quality function deployment if you do this properly it is not a short process uh so you need to resource it you need to pay attention to it and you need that, to manage that, it that uh, that mike gives us another episode where we can talk only of qfd with <laughs> cost build up because people think that the cost is not in build up in uh, qfd and you and me know that the cost got subsequently built up in QFD. And very few people use oh, this. Yeah, a lot of times you'll see somebody do one QFD and they'll never do another one because <laughs> you've got to do, you've got to that's, put a that's, lot. That's why another episode, uh, Mike, that's why another episode. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many episodes. All right. <laughs> so now after that, this is simulation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, okay, this is a drawing of a Monte Carlo simulation. I picked this, and I'm, I'll be honest with you, I've done Monte Carlo simulation. I don't know what they, what they plotted, but I thought it was an interesting picture. But um, there is so much software out there right now that's doing simulation. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are, there are people that are so good at it. I mean, I've watched people that struggle to simulate a factory and and I know a guy that can that can walk through your factory a couple times and in the next 48 hours 
he can have a pretty complete model of your production process. And it's because he understands, he understands the process, he understands the software and he understands how to, how to create the simulation. So there's huge amounts of leverage. Uh, the software is, is extremely good and it's getting better daily. Which is the one technique. that you sent? Uh, I didn't, I the one I did was crystal ball. Okay. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different programs out there that do it. Uh, and the simulation I did that gave me the 8 million PPM was, was crystal ball, but, uh, but yeah, you can do this. And the good part about simulation is there's cost involved, but it's a lot less cost than if I'm out, you know, doing soft tooling and then hard tooling and, and yeah. figuring out what does and doesn't work that way. With the simulation, I can I can shortcut that. I can I can cut down the time. So I'm making it faster. I'm making it easier. Uh, you know, and I can create these results that uh let me take a product into production that's cleaner than it was ever going to be if i didn't have those particular techniques that's so i know this is a very i know this is a very odd drawing but <laughs> it's no, very but hard to create a lot of sense into, into the context that we have been discussing in part one part two and part three this makes a lot of sense when this is the way that you cope up with speed the best thing that i know and what you touched upon that it has to be uh, the, at, the, at the design state itself. And you don't have any chance to go back and redo everything what you have done. So this makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it does. I mean, and you know, you can get simulation software is actually used to be this very expensive packages. You can get simulation software for next to nothing anymore. You know, or relatively next to nothing. You know, so you know, and then you know, again, you get you get some of these people that are so I don't know. They just they have a way with with computers and software. They can, it's amazing what they can produce for you. You know, in next to no time whatsoever. So simulation is huge. Okay, to me, it's it's really a huge key to the future. Okay, so, yeah. so can we have a one liner from you? How will you sum up the three parts? <laughs> no, this three part doesn't have to do with uh, Duran's tri triology. Okay, <laughs> this is my <laughs> triology of okay, I mean, a dense life in the fast lane. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's something we don't have a choice about. Okay, I mean that's you've got to accept that. Okay, is the speed that things are moving is it's is something that's out of our control, and it's not going to go slow. Okay, and people are only going to go so fast. Okay, so you've got to learn if you want to live in this gap, you've got to learn to understand the gap. Okay. Uh, you've got to learn where you've got opportunities. Okay. What, what technology can I take advantage of? How can I dip, build a strategy? Do I want to go iteration? Do I want to go breakthrough kind of, of uh, disruptive technology? Do I want to have a combination of both? Uh, and how do I want to enter that market? And what do I want to do? I mean, if somebody, if somebody, if Jobs would have told somebody he was going to kill iPods with an iPhone, they would have thought he was nuts. Okay, so I mean, it's got to, it's got to be that person that's, that's got that grasp of technology and that vision. Okay, that's, uh, and they've got to be willing to take risk. Okay, I mean, you look at Musk. I mean, my God, the, the risk Musk when he start stepped into the the electronic vehicle market and now look at him i mean you know he can't build cars fast enough so you know you look at this stuff and and he's already you know he's bet the bank on being in the electronic vehicle market and somewhere behind him the battery technology is going to get better and better and better you know making the vehicles more and more viable so it's 
it's all about managing speed. It's about, it's about knowing that it's going to get faster, accepting that it's going to get faster, understanding you've got to move faster, but understanding there's different ways that you can move strategically to stay competitive, stay relevant, and stay in your marketplace. And what is it they always yell at, you know, in the football games, stay in your lane, stay in your lane. Okay. You know, do you want that, that gap? That's your lane. Okay. I want to operate in there. It's a pretty wide, it's a pretty wide lane, pretty big gap. But, uh, you know, if you go wandering out, you know, I'm pretty sure if you're part of Elon Musk's group and you work over at Tesla, you probably don't spend a lot of time down at SpaceX. Uh, you know, and then nobody talks about the boring project that they've got over here in, in Georgetown. So, you know, stay in your lane, stay focused, you know, don't try and do it yourself. I mean, it's almost impossible, you know, if you want to understand the technology, if you want to understand, you know, the people and how you're working with the people, you know, you almost have to have people that specialize in that, you know, and then you stay in the middle and manage that, that gap. You manage the, how everything mixes together, the system level thinking that you've got to have to keep you on the forefront. So that's kind of how I see what we've just gone through. Uh, yes, thank you very steps. much. And uh, thank you. Grateful to you. Uh, so good. And uh, I think you can uh, stop sharing the screen. Okay. I can yeah, I, and, and, and I, negotiate, you, uh, negotiate with you for a space trip together. <laughs> And then we have episodes uh, that we will be doing together with respect to that dimming is still relevant today, irrespective of the speed. We can talk a lot, oh, about, yeah. a lot of things. So we are connected. We will remain connected and uh, we'll do many more episodes. Thank you very much, Mike, to have come in. So here, well, I thank you. Recording.